Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. Our last couple of chapters, we've learned that um, our, our Heavenly Father, He, not, there are accidents that happen, but if you want to make the eternity, all you got to do is repent. And that there's always room in our Father's kingdom for whomsoever will, simply to repent, <coughs> excuse me, and be a part of that family. And then in the last, the close of the last chapter, chapter 14, he said, I, I want you to not lose your savor. By that, I want you to be a little salty. What does that mean? When you go into a, a meeting or a place, season it a little bit, spice it up, make it interesting to the people. If you just lost your salt, you don't, you're not really representing God and you don't have the presence of the Holy Spirit. So, and naturally, something that is not salted is so bland that it's not edible hardly. So, this is what the Holy Spirit does for you when you are, when you are gifted. And it is a gift to have Him dwell within you, whereby that Spirit lightens the room and salts it, whereby it does change the season and the savor. Otherwise, what is salt good for? Don't miss this point either. All it's good for is changing the the flavor. If it loses that, it's worthless. And you know something? So is one of God's elect that loses their savor. They're just not really too good for anything. They have no purpose. Do I think that's possible? Well, I, I, I really think that... Um, one of God's elect, it could not happen to, but it could to some that think they are God's elect. Chapter 15, verse 1, different subject, let's go with it. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And they, these are sinners, and this is who needs the word. Don't forget that. Verse 2, and the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. They're muttering and they're threatening. You know, if you miss the point that you don't believe that God sent his election and those that have the truth, those that have the salt, to change those that have no hope, that is to say sinners that need God's word, that's who he sends us to. So therefore, never be one of these so self-righteous hypocrites. That's just too good to go around somebody that needs a little help. Okay, that's the point. Verse 3, And he spake this parable unto them, saying, For what man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? Now, what does 100 stand for? It stands for God's election of grace, and it stands for the children of promise. So even if you've got the children of promise, he's not going to let one be lost on their own without going. And what? Verse 5, And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. He carries you. When you're lost and when you can go no further, he carries you. Verse 6, And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Uh, and, you know, th this is something I want you to really get hold of. So many people say, Well, it's just so hard for me to find somebody that will hear the word. And finally you find that one. Do you understand? that what he's saying here, even the angels in heaven rejoice when you find one that will listen. I'm talking about you. 
when you find one soul that will listen to you and will hear that truth and grab on to it, even the angels in heaven rejoice. That's what he's talking about here. The children of promise as they take that word among the sinners to hear. Verse 7, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. If we've got, this just can also be um, um, uh, self-justification, if you would. Some people, they get a little bit too much that way. You've said this to the Pharisees. You get this too much self-justification until uh, really you're too good to realize people need help out there. But again, I want to emphasize again you may think I've gone years and have, have just found one. That's enough. Because even then, the angels in heaven rejoice when you find that one and bring them to repentance. It's worth it. Verse 8. Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, uh, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. In other words, um, she, she's going to clean that house and she's going to look for it. And th this, is, this represents the Holy Spirit and, and finding those that um, are of value, those that are of value to Almighty God. She's going to seek, she's going to the testimony itself, ten being the number of testimony, ten pieces of silver, and that testimony uh, with the uh, the woman representing that Holy Spirit, and uh, and what is it that lights a candle? Let's that light shine, proves it by light, finds it by light, and that light is Jesus Christ. Verse nine, and when she have found it. She called her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. And, and, and so it is when the Holy Spirit finds one soul through the, through the efforts of God's elect. That's you, God's children. Verse 10, Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God, over one sinner that repenteth. This is an awesome thing, and you've got to remember that. Many people say, well, I, I don't know that God pays any attention. Not only God, but the angels themselves. When you put out the food, and when you're talking to a group of sinners, or one sinner, and any one of those repent and come to the truth, it makes you feel joyful. You are excited about it. You feel good that you were able to share. But the reason you're feeling good is there's rejoicing also in heaven through the Holy Spirit. God and those angels. So you see, this is not a small thing. And that's why it's not a small thing serving God. And that's, what you, that's why you must always keep your saltiness. You must always be ready. You must not destroy your credibility, but at the same time, you should be ready and a willing servant of the living God. Um, when, when one lamb is lost, you're going to hunt for it. You know, people in agriculture have a little advantage on this. We've had it happen to us at one time or the other. And it is, it's, you, you, you love those creatures. You love them. Well, so does God love his people. And and um, when he goes after them, he carries you. When you can go no further, he's going to pick you up and he's going to carry you back into the kingdom and there will be rejoicing. Now we go to another parable. It is deep because it not only covers this earth age, but it even goes back into the earth age that was. It has to do with God's election and those that do repent and come into the kingdom in this generation. Uh, this this uh, dispensation of time. <clears throat> so having said that, let's get right into it and we'll explain as we go. Verse 11, And he said, A certain man had two sons. Verse 12, 
And the younger of them said to his father, and father represents our heavenly father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto him, he, and he divided into them his living. And, and, and so it is. Usually the first, he's not the firstborn, so he only gets one-third where the firstborn gets a double portion, which is two-thirds. But we're not talking about real estate here. The, 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 his, um, the portion is the movable portion. It's what today we would call liquidity, like your money in the bank. Okay? So, uh, let, let, let me have that. I, I want to go on my own. And Father gave it to him. He didn't send, understand, God didn't send him. God didn't order it. It's all this lad's idea, okay? In other words, he's doing it to himself. Verse 13. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. I mean, he had money. He could buy friends. I mean, friends were plentiful. The party was grand. And he was having a ball, he thought. Verse 14. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. I mean, big time. Now, I mean, with the money gone, he found out those people he called his friends weren't friends at all. They were pretending to take advantage of his liquidity, his money. And when it was gone, Zippo, they're gone. He's all alone. He has no family and no support. There's a famine, a shortage of everything. And he is in big need, big time. And, uh, so, and so it is. Uh, verse uh, 15, then, to continue. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Lowest carnal flesh there is. I mean, he's sent out here uh, to be a pig boy. He's just, I mean, you just live out there with the hogs. Verse 16. And he would fain, or he longed for, have to have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. He didn't have anything, not even the citizen that was uh, allowing him this. This is the pods of a curb tree, and uh, that's all he had to eat then. Now, this is a time of remembrance. And let's see what it is that he begins to remember. Here he is in the hog pen. He's eating what the hogs are eating. And a corp pod is not all that uh, enticing. Verse 17. And when he came to himself, when he finally got his common little common sense back, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. <laughs> my, my father's servants have it better than I do. Here I am out here in a strange place. And when you're in the world today, you're in a strange place, my friend, when it comes to family and God's blessings. Satan is the prince of darkness and the ruler of this world, and you don't have to look very far to come to that realization. Verse 18, I will arise, now that he can think straight, I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And uh, I mean, what he's really done, he's worshiped Satan in Satan's way with with um, harlotry, spending, living fast life, riotous, right? and, and so it is. He was in bad shape. And unfortunately, many are going to worship the false Messiah if they're not careful because they don't understand the tribulations. Verse 19, And am no more worthy to be called thy son. 
make me as one of thy hired servants. I, I want to come home. Now, I'm, I'm just decided I'm going to go back and tell him that his servants have it better than I do out here. And, and I'm, I'm not worthy because I left. And now take me back and just let me be a, an employee. Verse 20. And he arose and he came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Knew he had had a change of heart and a change of mind and was back in the right way of thinking. And, um, uh, and how he, he, was, he had humbled himself. He was no longer that one that was ready to be riotous in the world, big money boy, lots of friends for his money, and, but he had humbled himself and recognized who our Father was. And this Father represents our Heavenly Father. Okay. He will never leave you nor forsake you, but you can sure forsake Him. Be careful. Verse 21, And the Son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy Son. 22, but the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Now this lets you know what dire straits he was in. He didn't even have shoes on his feet. And there's something else you need to know. He's kind of preparing him with the gospel armor. The ring is a signet. It means I'm giving you back family power. In other words, uh, the rings, the king's ring and signet was the seal that allowed purchases and various other things. Uh, so he, he's being reinstated. Verse 23, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. And here you have in this parable playing out what was before. When the lamb was found, brought home, even the angels in heaven rejoiced. And so it is that our Father is making merry. Our Father is rejoicing because this one who was lost, this one who came to his senses in the hog pen, wallowing with the sows, woke up to what was happening and realized what shape he was truly in. And, um, and here, uh, Father, I mean, he's bringing him right in all the way, 24 and this my son was dead. He was mortally dead, going to hell if he hadn't changed. And is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. And, and what, what you have here is you have the older son who was chosen, if you would, in the first earth age. As it is written in, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, I chose you before the foundations of this earth. It's always, God's elect have always been with the Father, always doing His work. They did it in the first earth age, and they're going to do it here. They have no choice and, uh, other than to do that. And here, He's still out in the field working, doing God's work. But here, um, He's about to come home, and there's a big party going on. Verse 25, And His elder son was in the field doing God's work, and as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. I mean, there, there's a party going on. People are happy. That's good. 26. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. What's going on up there? Verse 27. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And this is something you want. Are you safe and sound? Uh, you want to remember, you, that's what repentance does for you. This lad had repented, and he was pleasing in our Father's eyes. He was reinstated. Why? On repentance. He humbled himself. But here we still have this one. This is a good lesson for God's elect. And those that uh, There's a great payday coming. And some receive rewards here, and others have received them long ago and will always continue to. And um, 
they, they have a precious reward. Father is their portion. Our God himself, our Heavenly Father, is their portion. Verse 28, and he was angry. Got away from him for a minute. He was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. Father's always got time for you. Father's always got time for that one. You see, the one that stays in the field working is the one that pleases God. That's why you don't want to be take the first one taken from the field by the false Messiah. Okay. And that's what this lad symbolically has happened to him. But here, God's election has always been right there, steady on, and has... Uh, God's work means more to him than anything else in the world, and he continues straight on, keeps plowing. But he was angry when he saw this uh, for a moment. That's only natural. Verse 29, And he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy um, commandment. And yet thou never givest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. Not yet, but there's a wedding coming and how precious it's going to be. How our father does love his children. You see, it's difficult for one to understand about the election that our celebration comes, even if you would, uh, on the Lord's day. That's when, that's when um, we can rejoice. And in the millennium, everything Father has is ours. You're not, uh, you're, you're not going to have it. I'm, I'm going to go back to Ezekiel chapter 44 and um, verse 28. Uh, I want you to know who God's elect have. Why? The, the 44th chapter of Ezekiel, is, you're already in the millennium. And Father is giving allotments of land and so forth uh, as inheritance to the people. But what about God's elect? And that's what this one is symbolic of working in the field. I'm going to read this 28th verse, Ezekiel 44. And it shall be unto them for an inheritance. I am their inheritance. That's God speaking. I am their inheritance. And you shall give them no possession in Israel. I am their possession. Meaning you... Everything that God owns, you do. It doesn't get any better than that, my friend. That is well worth it. And, and one that is one of God's elect recognizes that, has patience and maturity in it, knows they must stay the course. There, there'll be some rough knocks. That's all right. God chooses only the strongest. They'll cut it. They'll make it. And, and uh, God will strengthen them. They will always make it through. Why? They're God's election. They know from God's word what it is that we're to do. To keep that plumb bob straight on that line. And to see that the children are fed the truth in God's word. Whereby they're not deviated off course by things of this world. That are so easily to, uh, there to beset one and catch them off guard and make what they might think is enjoyment when it'll kill you. Okay. It'll ultimately take you down, the enjoyment of the so-called world, when in Christianity is true pleasure, is to love him, to serve him, and as a true Christian, to know each other, and to be in his service, doing his work, and waiting for that time, knowing God is never going to cut you out and knowing and trusting him that he knows everything that you have need of. But at the same time, he knows when he must move you in his will, he may have to do things sometimes that will seem a little tough to you, but you can cut it. Why? Well, you plow deep. Why? Because God chose you and you plow deep in the first earth age at Satan's rebellion, and you're going to do it again. That's why this elder son, why his father would go out and why he would talk to him. Let's see what he says to him here. Verse 30, after he told his dad, he said, you've never done any of that for me, 30. 
But as soon as this thy son was come, this, this uh, one that wanted his liquidity, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And, and, um, and here you have it. Again, I want to reemphasize that even the angels in heaven, when one does return, rejoice. So be able to appreciate that yourself. Don't show any jealousy in God's favor of blessing that one and welcoming, welcoming them home. Why? Because it is a time of merriment. That's what we're all about is planting seeds, converting people, and bringing them back into the kingdom of God. This is why especially the prior, the last verse of the prior chapter is so important. You've got to be a little salty. Being a little salty gives you the courage, the knowledge, and the wisdom, and the wherewith to understand the deeper things in God's Word and to know that God loves especially those that He chose as His election, and He is their inheritance. He is their portion. And finally, he will show this one. 31 to continue. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Do you understand that now better? All that I have is thine. Why? Because God's his inheritance. Not just the liquidity here, not just a few shekels down here that he can go party with. But everything in this world is owned by our Heavenly Father. And your part, your inheritance, as one of the first fruits, as one of God's elect, is God Himself. Everything that God owns is yours. You have a part in it. That's why it's well worth working for. That's why it's well worth putting out the effort to know and to understand even this parable, parable especially, because it is of the prodigal son. It is those people that go astray, and actually why we were sent is to the sinner, to bring them back into the fold, to teach them, and to let them know that God does love them. And, and again, well, it doesn't seem like that much to me. It does to the angels and God in heaven because they rejoice when you accomplish that one little thing of planting a seed and that person grabs it and sees it and hangs on to it for dear life. It can change lives. It's salty and it seasons life. It gives life and it causes people to understand. So study on and study the course it's a slow go sometimes, but that one, that very one is worth it all, is to see that one come into the kingdom and God and the angels to embrace that one in their arms, to take him back home, and especially God Zadok, the elect, having a part in everything that is God's own. Verse 32 to complete the chapter. It was meet that we should make merry. It was necessary. And be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. That's what makes it all worthwhile. You know, for someone to be spiritually dead. I mean, here, here that one, I mean, that took him clear that to the lowest level of actually living with carnal flesh, the lowest carnal flesh there is, a bunch of hogs in a hog pen. I mean, sloppy, muddy mess. That's what he sunk to before he had the courage to wake up and understand the love of our Heavenly Father. And the fact of the wickedness and the trickery, deception that Satan will work in the minds of people if you're not careful in the ways of the world. Oh, but it's so nice out there. Oh, no, it isn't. 
It is a dangerous, sick, diseased, mixed up world. You don't need the disease. Christians don't have to worry about that disease. But uh, those that get out into the world do. And as long as God sees fit to correct you, it means he loves you. Because when he loves you, he will chastise you. And when he stops chastising you, and he just about had this old boy, there he was in the hog pen, all the way at the bottom. And who sent him there? I want you to think about that. Who sent the boy? Whose fault was it? It was his own fault. People must recognize responsibility on themselves. It was his idea. It was against his own father's uh, wishes. His idea that put him in that position. But praise be to God, it was his own thought and conscience and memory of what was good within his father's house that brought him back home willing to only be a slave. Just like you've heard many people say, if I can just make it to heaven and just, just be a doorkeeper or something. That'll be good enough. Well, we're anxious to get to make that uh, cut. Well, uh, to, to be a part of the family of God is a wonderful thing. But this young lad put himself there, but he brought himself with his own cognates back to the Father, back home, and back in good standing. And the thing is, God's election many times that have stayed and worked in that garden straight through, it's real easy to be disappointed and kind of um, jealous sometimes. Don't be. Even the angels in heaven rejoice when one of these new ones is dead. God loves all of his children. And when one of them sees fit to come back to life, a spiritual life, making the eternity, that's why they rejoice in heaven. Why? Because that's our home. That's our eternal home. And it will be right here on earth when all is said and done. That's why that always be responsible for your actions. Don't always point fingers at other people and try to lay the blame. And don't ever blame the acts of a criminal or a bad person on your regular citizens. It's not their fault. It's his fault. And know that God is on the throne. And when you accomplish that one thing, even the angels in heaven rejoice. That's really something, friend. Did you know you had that kind of contact with our Heavenly Father? Well, you do when you serve Him. Don't ever forget it. You don't want to end up in the hog pen. You want to be a servant of the living God. All right, don't miss the next lecture. Bless your hearts. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the Spirit moves, you got a question, share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We do not judge people. It's not our job. Our Father does that. We want to be pleasing to the Father. But you do have the right to spiritually discern, that's a gift from God, to discern what is right and your responsibilities. Don't ever forget it. 
that helps you find the correct path whereby you have that way that is always pleasing to God in heaven. All right, those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Always a pleasure. Got a prayer request? You don't need the number. You don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. God, God is very aware of everything that happens in this world. And, and uh, he is so pleased with his election when they do what is right. Think about it, all right? Let him know that you love him. He wants your love, and he does love you. He may not love what you do all the time, but he sure loves you. Return that love and be blessed. Won't you do that? Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. And we got a, a pretty here. This would be... Um, I am, my name is Hope, I'm age 11, from Michigan. Is it bad to say Xmas instead of Christmas? My grandma listens to you every day. Faith is my cousin, and she sent a question, too. And, I, and your other cousin sent one, too. It's good. Your grandmother keeps you all cracking there. That's good. I'm proud of you. You know, um, the, the letter X in the Greek alphabet is chi. And, and um, when we are doing documentaries and we see an X and then you have a, a reverse P placed on it, it's, that's a row in the Greek. That's, that's chi uh, R, C-R. In other words, it's symbolic of Christ. Uh, but it is not, we do not want to cut Christ out of the mass that we have at his conception. So it's better to, uh, he likes to be, you like to be, uh, you like to hope, you like to be called by your full name, and so does Christ. Uh, Herman from Missouri, since we were created in the first earth age, how was our spirits, our souls, assigned to our parents in the second earth age, the flesh earth age? Well, it, uh, our Father has a reason and a purpose for everything, but the beauty is I always feel and teach that you are born into what you deserve. But the beauty of Christianity is wherever you are, you always have the privilege of working out of it. Even the tares themselves, even the Kenites, have the privilege and the opportunity in God's love to repent and find life eternal if they so choose. That's how precious our Father is. And he, uh, I, I never question his fairness because he's always fair. And quite frankly, it's really a dangerous thing to wonder otherwise. Uh, so we, we get what we deserve, but we can always do better. All right, that's, that's the thing that Christianity always brings us up, not down. Harley from Ohio, I heard you say several times that Jacob and Esau had two separate fathers. I have to disagree with you. I don't think you've ever heard me say that, okay? Would you please explain Romans 9.10 that says they both had the same father? I think what, you're hear, what you've heard is to me to say that Cain and Abel had separate fathers. You've never heard me say that... Um, that Jacob and Esau had separate fathers because they didn't. Okay, um, you're you're confusing Cain and Abel with those two. Okay, John from Florida, why does God have to have bodyguards like Michael, the archangel? That is, uh, what is he afraid of? He's not afraid of anything, but he is careful. He's wise, and besides that. There were a group, Michael and Gabriel, I'll take those two, that they're so precious to Almighty God that they didn't even have to be born a woman as we are, God's elect. Never had to be born a woman. They served God straight through, and they still do. And uh, so, uh, so actually... Um, they, uh, that is one reason he would not. But at the same time, we have Satan to deal with. 
And Satan is wicked, crooked, a thief. He will kill as many of God's children as he has an opportunity to. By that I mean lead them into death because of his pride in himself. And that's why that we have to be on guard. Our father, I mean, you know, look at Haman Gog and how it ends in Ezekiel chapter 39. We have a beautiful army, but in that final battle of Haman Gog, I'm not talking about Armageddon, but in Haman Gog, a whole army comes against us. God does not ask us to lift a hand. He destroys them. He, and you don't ever think he's afraid of anybody. But he does have order. And to have order, there must be discipline. And to have discipline, there must be disciplinarians. Michael and, and Gabriel are disciplinarians. They're going to see that God's word comes to pass as it's written. They're servants of the living God. Michael from Washington are we physically going to hear the seven trumpet sound, especially the sixth and the seventh trump? You, you don't have to hear them. You will by the actions that transpire when each of them sound. Why? Well, what does the trumpet do? It, it, it executes the command. It means it starts. Well, what is it at the sixth? the Antichrist appears. Don't think you're not going to know it. It's going to be advertised around the world. And the news and headlines won't be that Antichrist has returned. The headlines will be Christ has returned. And the whole world will whore after him that, is, that are deceived, that do not know that he comes at the sixth trump. And then, of course, you're going to know the seventh trump in more ways than one. You're not going to have to hear it, but physically a change will happen to you. You will change from your flesh body and trans uh, into your uh, spiritual body. And, and there we go into the Lord's day, for the true Christ will return at that time. There will be no difficulty in recognizing the sixth or the seventh trump. The fifth trump is going now. It is to teach what happens at the sixth and seventh so that God's children that will study and listen are not deceived. Stand from Vermont. Last time you taught Hosea 3, you said that Israel was all 12 tribes, but unless I missed it, you teach only the ten northern tribes. Also in Hosea 4.1, you teach the ten northern tribes. I agree with Bullinger that all twelve tribes are included here. Which are, where are we wrong? Thank you. Well, I think you're maybe a little confused by house of Israel and the nation Israel. The house of Israel is twelve tribes. The nation of Israel, I'm sorry, the house of Israel is ten tribes. I'll say that again. The house of Israel signifies 10 tribes. The nation Israel, 12. Because why? There is a split. The house of Judah is two tribes. And the house of Israel is 10 tribes. But the nation Israel, this is why that you hear me say many times when the word Jacob is used, it signifies all 12 tribes for he, the father thereof. Okay. Uh, Loretta from Indiana, um, thank you, you're welcome. Question, what is a heretic? Can you explain Titus 3.10? I would li sure like to know what this means as I don't understand this. Well, it, it's real simple. It's, um, uh, what it says is there is uh, if, if you have a heretic two times, then it's time for him to go. Because what a heretic does, uh, check it out in your Greek, is they split churches. They're always going north when everybody else is going south. Okay. They, they are never with the program. And they always teach something opposite of what the belief of the, the founding fathers are. Therefore, they are a destroyer a splitter of churches, a schism, 
and practice schism and are a danger. And that's why um, Titus uh, 3.10 simply says, get rid of them. They're, they're, they're trouble. Um, never, they never pull together. Ray from Canada, how do we know if the good Lord is punishing us or not? Well, as long as he loves you, he will. But many times you have to realize we bring things on ourselves also. And I, I believe that if a person always take respon takes responsibility for their own actions, and you pray in the morning when you start out, and if God thumps your gourd a little bit, say thank you, and go on, change to the other plan, and, and keep plowing. But... Um, Make sure, don't don't think that everything that goes wrong is God's correction, but God is going to move His elect where He wants them, because they're already judged from the first earth age. He can interfere in their lives to bring Scripture to pass as it's written, and He makes it well worth their while. Shirley from Arkansas, please explain Ezekiel twenty-three verse one. Well, twenty-three verse one simply introduces Ahola and Aholaba which are two um, would-be names for the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Okay. Ahola is the house of Israel, and Aholabah is the house of Judah. God expected a little more out of Aholabah than he did Ahola. And uh, they both turned out to be harlots. Why? Because idolatry. They kind of broke off and kind of began chasing other gods and so forth. And this is why that in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8, God divorced the house of Israel. Bam! I mean, he gave her a written divorce. Nancy from California, why do you say that there are different races in the world? I agree that there are different ethnicities and nationalities, but only one race, the human race. Please explain. Thank you. I don't think I could explain anything to you, Nancy. If you don't, if you don't understand there are different races in the world, then there wouldn't be much I could help you with. And there's there. Do you think that sounds like um, a bad saying? No. God created the races on the sixth day, and He looked and He was proud of every one of them. And um, yes, they are called ethnos in the Greek tongue, if that's what you're confusing yourself with. But. Um, uh, it is true that all beings are human. All beings have souls. But there are different races. And, and unless you are blind, all you have to do is walk down a street and you'll be acquainted with several of them. And they are different races. That's the definition, the proper uh, thing. You know, uh, political correctness has got our our vocabulary so messed around that common sense can hardly prevail and people like to confuse themselves uh, by saying we are all one. We're not. You know, you're, this, is, this causes racial problems by not respecting each race with dignity for its own ethnicities, its own customs, and treat them with dignity and respect them. And there's no problem. Uh, Joan from Georgia. When I watch TV, I see people putting their hands on a Bible and swearing to God to tell the truth. Is this okay to do? I agree with promising to God, but I don't like swearing to God. What is your opinion of this? How does God view this situation? Well, it's his word. It's his letter to us. And thank God it's probably the only time a lot of people have ever touched the word of God. And maybe, maybe that's a good sign. Maybe it brings some of the best out in them to tell the truth. I don't see anything wrong with it. To me, the Word of God is a letter that God wrote to His people. And, and He expects us to take that letter, to hold it, to use it, to, to have it every day in our lives, to draw from it, to take advice from it, to plan from it. Uh, it should be a part of our lives. For Christ is the living word, the logos. And, and so it is. Uh, I, I see nothing wrong with it. 
Now, if God puts a conviction on you, that's fine. No, no problem. We, uh, we're still buddies. Louise from Alabama. When I was about 14 years old, I made fun of the Holy Spirit when I went to my brother's church. I was told that I would never be forgiven. I know my Father and the Holy Spirit. I don't want to go to hell, will I? Absolutely not. You know, uh, Louise, the don't, man can't tell you whether you're going to heaven or hell. God does. And, and God knew that at 14 you were innocent. And probably, I'm going to assume it was the way they were acting and what they called the Holy Spirit maybe wasn't even the Holy Spirit. Okay. So uh, don't cut yourself too short. There's only one unpardonable sin. You did not commit it. It could only be committed by God's elect after, listen to me, after the Antichrist appears on earth. That hasn't even happened yet. So you're home free. God has forgiven you. God loves you. You return that love and be blessed. You're heaven bound. Jason from Iowa, as long as you continue following him. Jason from Iowa, my question is, I heard and is it true that man will bring up arms against God? Well, um, naturally, you could read, I, I quoted it earlier, Ezekiel chapter 39, that Haman Gog will come, Gog will come against God's children, were the unwalled cities, which is the United States of America, along with Canada, going to come right against us into the land of Russia. And, and as it is written in Ezekiel 39, not our army going to knock them down. God is going to destroy them in their tracks before they ever reach one city. And uh, why? He wants them to know, you know, communism says there's no God. But he wants to show them that he is very real, that he is God, and he is going to clean their plow, big time. But the time they see him and recognize that there is a God, it'll be too late for some of them unless they can uh, saddle up and ride right in the millennium, okay? But it's going to be a bad day at Black Rock for uh, Haman Gog. That army will come against God. It will not, it won't last five minutes. Why? He's going to rain hailstones weighing 180 pounds down on them, big time. Kathy from North Carolina, please tell me the definition of Messiah. Messiah is a Hebrew word, and, and it means the anointed one. And you've heard me say that even the prime of it is as rubbing with oil of our people. That's what Christ is. He's the anointed one with the oil of our people. That's why Christians should anoint when they pray for healing. That's why Christians should anoint with the oil of our people. Well, what is the oil of our people? It's, do you know what the name of the olive tree is in the Hebrew tongue? Eliyah, which is the sacred name. God and his sacred name. And the oil from that tree, it isn't the oil that does it, but it's your obedience to use it and do it God's way that causes God's blessings to come upon, whether it's healing driving away something wicked from your home or sealing your home against any uh, evil influence in the name of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. David from Minnesota, Pastor Murray, you had stated that the course of Abiah is a date. My standard King James Bible states there are 24 courses of Abiah. I, I'm sorry, uh, I don't believe your um, King James Bible would state there are 24 cases of uh, courses of Abaya. For Abaya, there are 24 courses, but Abaya is only one of them. Uh, do me a favor, make a note of uh, Abaya is the eighth course, to make it simple. Out of the 24, it is known as the eighth course. Now, I want you to go to 1 Chronicles chapter 24, and I want you to read verse 10. When you read 1 Chronicles chapter 24, verse 10, it will say the eighth course is the course of Abiah. Okay. It will also tell you what all the other 24 courses are. They all have a different name. 
it is a date because of when that course, the 8th, came to be. Gloria from Michigan. Please explain Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Uh, that's one of the most beautiful verses in God's Word. It's where God gives you, in His name, power and authority over all your enemies, but not only over them, but to tread on them. I mean, make mincemeat out of them in the power and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, uh, many might say, well, isn't that hate speech? No, that's not hate speech at all. That's what needs to happen to Satan's little spirits and anything that he might send against the Christian nation. Okay, that's, that's just the way it is. And that's why it says to tread a bone. That means to stomp, okay? That means to walk on. That means to put under. Just like it's written, Christ is at the right hand of God until his enemies are made his footstool under his feet, treading upon them. Okay? It's going to happen, and it happens all the time, when one of God's elect puts down Satan's little practitioners. Oh, all right. Hey, I'm out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. But most of all, God loves you for it. Hey, it makes his day. And when you make God's day, boy, is he going to make yours. I mean, big time. Why, he loves you. Return that love to him and be blessed. Won't you do that? We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that? Again, blessing God, he always will bless you. But there's one thing that's more important than, than anything else in your life. And that's this. And you listen good. Listen good. Now, you stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus Yeshua is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. Genesis 1:46, the first six chapters in God's Word the world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular CDs. How and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar. For if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you have always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series.
Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book-by-book, chapter-by-chapter, line-by-line study of God's Word. Now, here is Pastor Murray. All right. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome again to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study. Praise God. We're glad you could make it. We're ready to get into our Father's Word. You know what? We're just going to visit again today. I've just got a few verses that I want to discuss with you to pick up on our discussion. And then I'm going to...